All right, so now to my favorite oil company in the world, which is Africa Oil. Um, uh, I see a lot of faces that have been here for a long time and, and watch the story grow. Um, I see a lot of people that are very happy. Uh, I assume that those are all the people that bought the shares when it was about a dollar, dollar fifty. I don't see too many frowns, uh, which would be the people that bought shares at eleven dollars. Um, but uh, um, what I'm here to tell you is that um, two years ago, when two to three years ago, when we talked about this company, it was kind of a dream of finding some oil in East Africa. And we didn't really have too much more of a dream than that, that maybe we could find some oil. Maybe if we were lucky, we'd find enough that we could actually build a pipeline and develop it. So I guess uh, what I'm here to tell you today is that this, that dream has come true. We, we do have enough oil now. We are going to develop it. We are going to build a pipeline. So I think phase one of that dream is done. Of course, once, once you have one dream, uh, you start having another dream. And um, I would have to say that what I've seen now, uh, the future looks beyond whatever even I could wildly dream. Uh, you know, we have 100 prospects uh, in our inventory. We drilled six um, of those 100. We have a 60% success rate, and we already have enough to do a field development. So it starts telling you how big could this thing be? And uh, those, those are, when I lay in bed, I don't count sheep, I, I count barrels of oil. And, uh, and unfortunately, I have a really hard time going to sleep because uh, there's just so many of them, I just have to keep counting and counting. But anyway, um, I think we have passed a big hurdle. We actually do have a development project. And I think what people are focused now on is the development. Well, you know, when is the pipeline coming? Um, what's the development scenario? How are you going to fund this? Uh, um, the, the number one question is, where, where are you going to get the money to, to participate in this? And I'll get to all of that. We'll, we'll talk about that. But uh, I want you to be cognizant that this is still what this company is. Yes, we are going to make some money in this, and this is now turned into a fairly low-risk development project. But this is still what the company is about. We are still an exploration company, and we still have uh, a very big upside in exploration. So as I said, 100 undrilled prospects. In the Lokachar Basin, we have 100% success rate. I've got 10 more prospects to drill in there. I remember telling you a couple of years ago that, that uh, Tolo had an 80, uh, a 93% success rate in Uganda, and we wouldn't expect to have that. Well, so far we're better than them, but uh, you know, I'm, not, I'm not advocating that we're gonna have 100% success rate, but that 80 to 90% success rate that they have in Uganda is starting to not look completely out of the, out of the question. Um, we have drilled a couple of other wells in the Turkana and Anza Basin. We'll show you a little bit about those. And, and we've proven some petroleum systems. I know the market doesn't get real excited when we have oil shows and, and uh, no tests of oil, but we do. As geologists, this is probably just as important as testing three or 4,000 barrels of oil in a day. Proving we have source, proving we have reservoir, proving we have seals. So I'll go through those. We've got two, we've got four new basin opening wells in the next six months. So I think this is what people should be excited about. If you understand the story, I think Lokachar Basin, we will make more discoveries and we will mark up that curve of value. So if you see us making a discovery in one of these new basins, that's the next step change. That's where uh, it's not a five or 10% increase in our share price, it's a 50, 60% um, uh, increase in our share price. So this is, this is the thing I think we're most excited about. Um, the good news is you don't need to be patient anymore. I think there's been some patience among the Africa oil people, um, uh, shareholders and management. Um, you know, things have moved a little slower pace than we would like to see. The wells have taken longer than we'd, we'd like to see. But we're getting much better at drilling our wells now, and we've got six rigs going full time. So this week we spud um, the Kirtule well, we spud the Agete well, Monday or Tuesday, we spud the, the Bahasi well. Um, two more rigs are going to be spud uh, working in, uh, in the first half of October. So from here on, every month you're going to be getting a result. Every every uh, uh, you know every time you pick up a newspaper, there's going to be hopefully some good news about Africa oil. So I, I won't belabor kind of the introductory slides. I like showing these, particularly for people that haven't been here before. Um, you know, why did we come to East Africa? Uh, we came here because we saw three countries that hadn't had any exploration in 20 years. 
um, despite the fact that all around them, people seem to be finding multi-billion barrel oil fields. So we're a company that's composed, that was made up of four geologists and one finance guy. So geology is the most important thing for us. We looked at the geology, we looked at these petroleum systems, like the Cretaceous system that went through Sudan and extended through here into Kenya. Um, the, the Jurassic Rift system that was so prolific in Yemen that extended into northern uh, Somalia. Uh, and then more importantly, recently, the tertiary system where we're starting to see some hints of progress in Uganda. It's the same system here. And once we can, we spend a lot of time on what we call dry hole analysis. So we look at all the wells that the other people drilled before us. We don't like making, repeating other people's mistakes. So once we thought we understood all of those wells and that we thought we could do things different and find oil, we, we went on a very aggressive campaign to get acreage. And we got a lot of it. We got 250,000 square kilometers, over 75 million acres. Um, and fortuitously, <laughs> Uganda started heating up then. And even Mozambique and Tanzania started heating up in the offshore to finally big gas discoveries. And all of a sudden, East Africa, which was kind of a pariah area that nobody wanted to be, became the hottest place uh, on, on Earth um, uh, in exact equal proportions to, to Kurdistan um, in, the, in the world to find, to find oil. So what that enabled us to do was to bring in good partners. So the first partner we got was Tullow. Tullow came in and, and basically be, they got into six of these blocks, um, carried us through exploration and brought a lot of their expertise from Uganda, uh, which was quite helpful to us. Then we got Marathon. Marathon came into these three blocks, and they're paying 100% of our costs going forward. So uh, as Adolf Van Bean you know, used to say, the, the, the best way to eliminate uh, exploration risk is to have somebody else pay for it. So we've been in that position for a long time. Zero risk if you don't pay anything. Unfortunately, with Tullow, we're out of that zero risk, and you'll see in our budgets, uh, we're starting to spend some of our own money now. But uh, uh, as long as we keep finding oil, I'm not too worried about it. And I'd like to throw this slide up too, which most of you have seen before. This is just our tertiary rift trend, which of course the Locust Shark Basin here, and the Cretaceous Rift trend. Um, just these blocks, uh, uh, which represent about 60% of our, our acreage, um, superimposed on the North Sea. So what you see is this, this acreage position is the size of the entire North Sea. And this just doesn't happen in today's age. <coughs> People ask me, what, what would you compare this to? I, mean, I don't really have a good comparison. You know, you, it's very rare on, on today's uh, earth that you can go into a frontier basin and open up a new basin that nobody's built before. Um, it's rare that you can find 11 basins that are geologically similar that haven't been opened up before. And it's almost unheard of that you can own 100% of those basins. So. Uh, as I said, we've got 100 unreal prospects and needs in this basins. Um, the key for us is de-risking some of these new basins. We'll talk first about the Lokashar Basin. I think we'll have a lot of success there. But the rest are frontier basins. Don't, don't kid yourself that this is a shooting fish in a barrel. Uh, we need to prove that the hydrocarbon systems in the rest of these basins work. And the single important factor geologically is source rock. Um, reservoirs, traps aren't really a big issue. If you've got source rock, if you've got a big, thick, rich shale pumping out oil, you'll find everything else. And so that's what we really need to de-risk uh, going forward. The Lokashar Basin has such a source rock. <coughs> it's a nice, big, deep basin here. Basically, everything you see in green and blue here is present-day oil mature. It's actually a, a thick 15% POC carbon source rock pumping out oil as, as we speak, as we stand here, it's still pumping out oil. Um, all of the prospects we've drilled to date are actually within that source kitchen. So there's no migration needed. It's, it's basically our reservoir sit right on top, right below, and in some cases right in those source rocks. So it, uh, the, the thing that we are encouraged about is every piece of porosity that we drilled in can fill with oil. Uh, some of it's not good enough to produce, but uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a testament to the source rock quality that every bit of this is, is filled with oil. So we've been kind of playing what we call our string of pearls here, uh, which are these basin-bounded fault trends. We've drilled two wells, Tuiga South and Gamia, both of which have been 
made the discovery. We're currently just finalizing a Thomas. Uh, we hope to have results of that uh, out in the market by the end of the month. And we just spot a get there. So uh, the four core ones in the middle of the basin, you know, we'll know within the next uh, 45 to 60 days. We also walk onto the other side of the basin on what we call the, the rift flank play, and we build the Atuco discovery, which really opens up this whole play fairway on the other side of the basin. So this basin has proven that this one's going to have a high success rate. And I think uh, uh, if you look at uh, the trap type, it's relatively the same all along the stream of pearls. There's a big basin bounding fault. There's a nice shallow reservoir here, the uh, where we're sand. It's very good quality. We've proven that now testing two wells capable of over 5,000 barrels a day each. Um, uh, core data from the Tweaka well, which looks very similar to this, the same type of dust basin bounding fault. Uh, which is, shows 29% porosity, 23 to 29% porosity, 100 millidarcies to, to <coughs> two darcies. I know millidarcies and darcies don't mean much to people. Um, a, 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 a reasonable reservoir is 50 millidarcies. A good reservoir is over 100 millidarcies. A great reservoir is over a darcy. So we have <coughs> good to very good reservoirs, I think, uh, in here. And it's been proven out by the test data that, uh, that we were able to uh, obtain. We also have some core reservoirs that we're kind of putting in the bank for later. We drilled into the Awerwer sands, which are generally poor quality sands in the Gamma well. And then we drilled this interesting 700 meter column of fractured, almost basement like rock. One or 2% porosity. We did flow oil out of it, uh, uh, about 15 barrels a day. Not very, not very strong, but um, there's 700 meters of it. So there's a, a hell of a lot of oil in place. You know, things like fracking, things like uh, the horizontal wells, we can bring it there. So we're going to do the easy stuff first. We're not, uh, we're not, we're not masochistic. We're going to go and take the take the easy stuff and, and develop it first. Uh, Atuco is a very interesting well for us. It's a little different than the ones we've been doing. There is a shallow reservoir here that we weren't able to test. This is not included in that hundred million barrel estimate that, that uh, we've been telling people. We are going to come in with a test rig, test these zones. We're also gonna drill this zone and, and test it. It's in 17 and a half inch holes, so that we didn't have any logs that were probably very shallow, 400 to, to 700 meters. Um, it may be slightly biodegraded, but I think uh, um, you know, we're, we're quite keen as very good looking reservoirs. The ones we did report are the ones here that are actually interbedded with the shales themselves. So some of you that might be familiar with the Bakken, the resource play, um, the, re the way these resource, these shale oil plays work is that you're right in the source rock and it's present day generating. And you're basically cutting out the middleman. You're just taking the oil right from the source rock instead of waiting for it to go into the reservoir. These sands are quite interesting in that they're interbedded within that mature generating source rock. Uh, if they are thick and continuous enough, and we'll be able to get some indication of that when we test them, they would act as infinite, an infinite number of horizontal wells draining the source rock. So this might be a, a, a case where you're actually tapping the source rock itself and that these actually get regenerated and refilled as, as you're draining them out. So again, a little bit more esoteric, a little bit more for the, the second wave, but uh, quite compelling. Uh, we had a nice zone of sand right at the top of the Lacombe. We had some Thinner, better, low, thinner, bedded, and lower quality sands that we need to test uh, down in the lower zone. So we'll be getting that test uh, rig on somewhere in the second half of October. We should start seeing some test data from that. But a good discovery, uh, 100 million barrel, um, and, and kind of pushing us over the edge. Uh, to, this is the one after after this we announced that we had a commercial project. So I want to spend a little bit of time on this slide. I think there's two or three slides that I would say if you want to walk away with something that's the, the important message of where we are in Africa, this is one of them. Uh, and it's the Lokadar Basin. It, taught, it, it shows you all of the resources, mm -hmm. all of the prospects, but the important thing is this is in the next six months. In the next six months, we're going to drill all of these wells. So we will have a well in every one of the core string of pearl prospects. We will have wells over on the other side of the basin that in the new project is opened up. And we will also appraise the Gamia and Tweega Talus discovery. So when we announced 368 million barrels of gross, everybody's excited about that. But when I say the, 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 the dream is still alive, um, you need to look at what that represents. So 
that represents these three fields, but it only re only represents a portion of those three fields. If you look at Yamia, they gave us credit for 180 million barrels, but if you look up dip, there's a big fault block here they didn't give us any credit for. There's 281 million barrels of prospective resource in that fault block alone. So together, if we drill this well, if we prove that that's there, this is 460 million barrels potentially just in Gambia. Same in Suiza. Um, they gave us 87 million barrels, but up dip there's another 132 million barrels. So this one on its own could be 200 million barrels just, just from Suiza. So just from Suiza and Gambia alone, essentially almost 700 million barrels of oil or double what we've got uh, now uh, in our food and in our QP category. The other thing you probably noticed last time I was here, all of these prospects along the string of pearls, they were generally 40 to 60 million barrel size. You know, look at them now, the uh, almost thing is 172. Um, Ucalis, which we're drilling now, 234. Agete, which we also just bugged uh, and is drilling now, 276. And ETOM has grown up to 467 million. So these things are generally about five times uh, what they were last time uh, we were looking. The reason is because our reserve auditors have now taken a look at the results of Tuiga South, not only the thickness, but the quality of the reservoirs. So they've taken the, the thickness of these reservoirs and, and at least doubled it in all the prospects. And they've taken the recovery factor, which was low, about 15%. And now it's ranging from 25 up to 40 percent. So that doubles the, the volumes again. So that's why the, the volumes have gone up so much. If you add all these together, you're, 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 you're approaching 2 billion barrels just by the string of pearls alone. And then on the other side of the basin, there's also some big prospects, 300 plus, 100. So, you know, this, this two, when, when Tullo and ourselves have told the market and our reserve auditors are telling the market, one to three billion barrels in the Locust Star Basin. Uh, that's just these guys right here that we've already mapped and we know and have had 100% success rate on. So I don't think we're really looking at a stretch on that. We also are shooting seismic. We're gonna shoot a 3D over all the string of pearls. We'll likely take that through and shoot the entire other side of the basin. And that's really more for development and, and, and uh, understanding these reservoirs a lot better. So if we only find this basin, this will, this will be certainly my most successful thing I've ever done in my career. Um, you know, it's very low risk. I think we're going to find a billion barrels of oil in this. I think that very likely we're going to find two billion barrels of oil in this basin. But I think let's let's keep in mind when we look, think about new basins that this isn't the end of the story. This this is really the beginning. So I'll, I'll, I'll I won't spend too much time on this. Uh, it kind of shows you. I'm just breaking out. This is the northern part of the southern string of pearls. Again, the Tuiga South, the Ucala as well, we're doing now, and then a couple of these other prospects. And they're, and they're big, they're not only big prospects, but they're very low risk. You can see on Ucala, our reserve auditor gave us a 56% chance of success. Um, also on Tuiga, you know, that up dip part I was talking about that could add 132 million barrels could give a 64% chance of success on that. And then Agate, which was the other one we're doing now, 54%. So this is better than 50 50 chance that we're going to find. Uh, on each one of these. And then ETOM is the one that's really grown. And the reason it's grown, it's grown in area. It's actually three fault blocks that stick together. And it's up to 467 million barrels, with each fault block having a slightly different risk. It's generally in the 25 to 38% range, with really the fault thing being key to, to trap with things that's slightly higher risk than the, than the simple ones that are just bowed against the fault. And even ETOM North, which you know didn't even make it out the last draft, it's 230 million barrels up here, another nice looking prospect. So a lot of really good looking um, low risk prospects lining up along there. The Collis is the one we're drilling now. We should, uh, we should have, uh, have results on that uh, uh, at the end of next week. Um, this is just some seismic lines again. I apologize for the non geophysicist, uh, but big basin bounding fault, nice rollover into the fault. These are very simple, easy structures to drill. So. Um, ETOM is the one up here that you can actually see is a complex of three different fault blocks, where the Gete is a fairly simple single fault block uh, up against the, the boundary. And then moving to the south, again, Gamia West, this up dip part that has 281 million, again, chance of success, 64% that that's going to be uh, coming to fruition. Amosane, another nice big simple prospect, 
172 million was a 34 percent chance of success. So it doesn't get that much better uh, from an expiration sense, having that higher success factor and having all of these lining up being very similar looking prospects. On the other side of the basin, we see eCuco that was our discovery, but we also have some very big prospects coming up there. And in fact, we're at the point, we're having a hard time sort of separating them. Remember, this is the old shell well that in 1992 tested a bit of oil. We can't actually separate it from the sub dip well. So it's possible that there's a, a, a very large cross um, structure that covers this whole area. If it's just this little fault block, it's 300 million barrels. So you can see that there's a lot of potential left on that other side of the basin. It is a downthrown normal fault. This is not as good as an uptrown normal fault like a Chico, so it does have a higher chance of, a lower chance of success yet if it has more of a trap there. So this well will be drilled right after we uh, test the Chico. So we'll have that probably by the end of the year, we'll have results on that as well. Uh, I want to move up north a little bit to, to Savisa. Uh, and, and this is kind of leading into these new basins and, and new areas. Um, I know when I when I published the results of the Savisa well, there weren't people, the people weren't very excited. Um, you know, we, we kind of said, well, we found some oil, we found some reservoir. I have to say, we were very excited. Uh, and the reason is because we're proving up a petroleum system. It, it's not so important to us that we find a big oil field and have 5,000 barrels a day test. It's important to us that we prove that the, all of the components are there to find uh, an oil field. So we, we drilled this well, Savisa. It looked like on the seismic we had that it was a basin bounding fault, that there was a roll into that fault, and that uh, it looked like a pretty similar to Twiga type trap. But what we found, we, there's a river that runs right along this fault trend here. We were able to get two lines across that river, and you'll see there's a big bullseye prospect here. And what it looks like on seismic is, this is where the Savisa well is, that basin bounding fault that we saw went all the way to the surface. It's actually just an interbasin high. So this, all of these reservoirs just spill up onto this, what we call Savisa West, West Prospect on the other side of the river. So looking at it in a cross section view, what we drilled, we drilled and we found a nice thick thousand meter shale, which is very important. The seal is one of the more important things we've got. You know, one of our worries is you drill a giant sand pile, there's no seals and, 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 and even if you're generating oil, there's nothing to stop it from just going to the surface. Um, we found a nice reservoir. We found about 30, 40 meters of Pliocene sandstones that looked like they had good reservoir quality. Um, and then we found oil trapped in these poor quality sandstones, which was the only part of this trap that was up against basement and had that trapping geometry. We probably could have tested some oil out of there um, if, if, if we'd uh, spent the time and effort, uh, seven to ten million dollars to, to do it. But what we thought was the better thing to do is to move over here. So we have seal. We have reservoir, we have source, but we don't have this trap. So we move over here, we've got a nice big horse block trap. You can see it there on the seismic uh, where everything's pushed up. And we've got these good quality sandstones we saw here surrounded by these Pliocene shale. So this is perfect trapping geometry. This one should work. It's small, 20 to 50 million barrels. That's not actually important to us because we're not actually that concerned about whether we find um, volume in this. If this works, suddenly all of these other prospects mm -hmm. start working. And more importantly, everything in the northern part of the of the uh, Turkana Basin, which is our biggest basin, starts looking a lot more attractive. So I'd say we're very encouraged about the fact that we've proven the petroleum system. Hopefully we'll test the oil out of the, of, out of the Chicule well. If we don't, we're still very encouraged and it's giving us encouragement to, to, to look in that basin uh, more. So, Kind of segueing into these new basins, um, we have some new stuff that you haven't seen before. So these three basins, the Chubahar, uh, what we call the western shore of Lake Turkana, and the South Cario, this, this is all brand new seismic. The last time we, we saw each other, we didn't even have this. In fact, this seismic I only saw myself about uh, a, a little over a month ago. So um, again, with the idea that we do have Lopero, but we'd like to open two or three more basins. Um, we, uh, we are going to be attacking in the, in the near future these three basins and the Bianza Basin. People don't seem to care about my poor friend, the uh, Cretaceous Basin. Uh, we drilled Pi Pi and once again, people didn't get 
get very excited about old Pi-Pi, but it's sort of the same thing as uh, the Vita. We found reservoir, we found seal, we found charge. Um, in that case, we found a trap. So there is an oil accumulation there. It is a bit deep, it's about 4,000 meters, and it is a bit tight because of that, and it possibly could be a bit gassy. So maybe I understand why somebody weren't so jump up and down about it. But for us, it proved this system works. And now we can come down to the Anza Basin and, and use that extension. So let's just walk through these. We'll start with the Chubahara Basin. This is probably the one we're most excited about, um, and, I'll, and I'll, 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 I'll show you why. Um, we were able to shoot all of this new seismic up there, and what we found is we actually have two basins, one in the north and one in the south, that we believe are capable of generating hydrocarbon. So these are kind of locochar size basins. We see, again, the string of pearls developing against the big basin bounding fault. We see some nice prospects out here on the ramp. Um, we are going to drill Shamila as our first well, which is right on this transform fault. So in rift basins, you often get these what they call transform faults, and, and the polarity of the basin changes where it's dipping down into this hole this way, it's dipping down into the hole the other way. So this is basically the, the transformation point that, uh, that, the, that the basin scissor against. And what we find uh, on these transform margins is they're a very good place to find oil. Um, in the Gulf of Suez, most of the biggest oil fields in the Gulf of Suez are located right along these transform margins. So um, again, Shamila will be a, a, we will drill this as soon as Tatule is done, we're moving the rig over here. We will drill this well, and it will be a basin opening well that really proves this one. Um, and if, we, if this proves up, then we've got the whole string of pearls and the ramp part to pursue like we did in Mokichar. Um, and then the, in the southern one, we've got the string of pearls that is on the other side of the basin. Uh, we're going to drill this one first, Jardine, which looks like a very nice prospect up against the basin bounding fault with source rock here. One of the reasons we're so excited about this is because of, of this. Direct, hydro, direct hydrocarbon indicators and ABO anomalies from the seismic. This gives us a pretty good clue that oil is being generated in this basin. So what they call it, what they call bright spots is when you come up on a structure like this, you see how that these seismic reflectors get much stronger. That's, that's an evidence that there's actually hydrocarbons, particularly gas in that system. Because gas is much lighter than oil, and when the, the, the rock, the, the seismic waves reflected off of there, it gives a much stronger signal. So when you see these kind of things here, you see, you see the, the same kind of things coming up on here, you see all these bright spots here, it gives you a lot of confidence that there's actually oil being generated. And, as, and if you remember, that is our biggest risk, the, uh, the, the generation of oil. So the first well we're going to drill here is Shamila. Again, not a big pros prospect, but a good test of the concept right next to the big deep cooking pot. We've got a number of things that look like bright spots and reservoirs uh, lapping up on the, on the basement there. Then we're going to move down to here. We're going to drill Jardine, which is on trend with this one. Again, the same kind of thing here. But there's a lot of other cool prospects here. If you look at these, uh, Sila, this complex is like 200 million barrels. And then all of these filter salt blocks, again, that have really nice bright spots on them, um, you know, up to 120 um, million barrels would be a, um, the biggest one there. We also know that we put CB3, CB5, CB7. That basically means we don't know what the hell we're going to find out there. Uh, we call it the green, the blue, and the yellow. And that's about as far as we know. So we, uh, um, it, it, this is frontier exploration. There's never been a well drilled in here. So um, we won't know how thick the reservoirs are. We won't know if the source part's any good until we drill a well. But we do get comfort from these bright spots that at least the source part is, is, is sorted out. Uh, we also are interested in this because this is that Chubahara Basin we just looked at. We've just signed this block in, in Ethiopia. That's a huge block, 42,000 square kilometers. And it's got some things that look like the same type of basins. This is even more frontier. We don't even have gravity data on this or seismic. So, but what we do have is oil slicks on the lake and tar balls along the lake shore. So we know there's a source rock generating there. So we're shooting FTG on this right now. Um, we will shoot seismic there first half of next year. Um, we're 100% in this right now, but we've uh, we've got a partner subject to our government approval. We'll be paying 100% of the cost of this uh, uh, of this program. Um, also, want to talk about Lake Turkana. Lake Turkana is quite compelling in that this is the uh, Cretaceous trend, this is the tertiary trend, 
what we're looking at is the intersection of these two trends. So it's quite interesting if you go the intersection of two rift basins, uh, you know, what, what, what does that mean structurally? So we now have shot offshore and onshore, and we've got all of this string of prospects here that look quite, quite interesting. But I have to say they look a lot different than anything we've seen before. I'll show you some seismic, and even, even non-geologists can see this is different stuff than what we have in, in, in the rest of the basin. But it's big. We also see bright spots there that tell us that there should be oil generated. So if you look at the seismic lines here, this is kind of a, uh, the, that string of prospects, including the big guy, Kassar. Look at the size of this thing. This, this fault here probably has 3,000 meters of throw on it. So um, this is much more dramatic than we've seen. This is what's a, a collapsed anticline, which actually is floored uh, with, with um, you know, fairly flat reflectors. So what, what's happening here is the old Cretaceous structure is being reactivated by the tertiary. So they're much more dramatic structures, much different looking structures, but, but very big things. And again, with these flat spots and bright spots here, um, good evidence of hydrocarbon. This is the deepest hole we've seen so far in any of the basins we've seen, which should be a good source rock system. Uh, it should be where the shales are, are gathered and where they become generative. So we are going to be drilling one of these wells. This one's a little more com um, complex than the others. Remember how simple Tricana was? It was just one big hole. Surrounded by prospects, this is several big holes, and this one may be a bit more complicated. But it, 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 it's got two advantages: that the prospects are big, but the other thing is that it may have Cretaceous reservoirs in it. So some of the thick Cretaceous reservoirs that you see in Sudan may be present in these as well. So we not only have tertiary targets, we may have the old Cretaceous targets as well. Um, this one here is the Cario Basin. So this one is actually kind of a splinter basin off the Lopitar Basin very proximal, and this is brand new seismic. This didn't even make it into our CGR report. So we've got some nice seismics here that, that show good structure along trends. We've got the same string of pearls set up that we have in the Lopita, with prospects along the basin boundary called a nice deep hole here that looks like it's capable of generating hydrocarbons. So again, uh, an interesting one here, um, fairly uh, um, um, frontier, again, no wells and just new seismic. So. We will drill one of these probably second half of next year, but it, it's a nice looking uh, new basin as well. And we'll be adding a, a number of uh, uh, prospects to our CTR report from this one. Again, don't forget about our old Cretaceous play. Again, no, nobody I talk to seems excited about it. I am. <laughs> these are big prospects. These are some of the, some of the biggest structures we've got in the, in the portfolio. Bahasi, we spun Monday or Tuesday. Um, it's on trend with Pai Pai, on trend with the, the, the 7 billion barrels of oil in Sudan. Uh, so very shallow. Uh, the, the main reservoirs, we'll start seeing them as, as shallow as five or 600 meters and down to uh, um, about 2,000 meters till we think we hit basement. So a big structure. Again, you can see some bright spots here indicating there's some hydrocarbons. So it's, it's, it's quite a compelling prospect. Sala is the second one we're going to drill. Again, a big old rollover anticline. Uh, some bright spots off of the flanks of it that seem to indicate hydrocarbons. Um, this one's a maybe a little more gas prone because it's near the Bogal Deep, but it's big enough that if it has oil and gas, it still be very interesting. And of course, the, the most important thing about this is that Marathon's paying 100% of the cost of this well, and uh, probably 75% of the cost of this well. So they're big prospects, they're free, and they do have good technical merit. So, Keep an eye on these. Uh, I, I'm, 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 I'm a champion of the Cretaceous, uh, uh, and I think uh, we've got a good chance of uh, proving up a, a new province here with these two wells. Um, one reason I say that is Marathon actually drilled these three dry holes. So to convince a big company like Marathon to come back into a block where they build three dry holes, if we have a different play concept and to pay 100% of the cost of them, um, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a little bit like uh, ice, ice cubes to Eskimos. Uh, this is the uh, pad. We finished it now. There, there, there actually is a rig there now. I thought about trying to Photoshop it in before the, uh, <laughs> before the meeting. But, uh, um, are there any, of, any of you coming on the investor trip next week? Lisa, you're not coming yet? So, um, you'll, you'll be some of the few that aren't. Um, just to give you an idea how, how interest is raised in uh, Africa oil, uh, I'll give you a couple of statistics. Uh, number one, we ran our first investor trip 
four years ago, we got seven people to come, but only when we agreed to pay their airfare. Uh, and I think give them free booze. Um, that, the second year we had 21 people. They paid. They all paid their own airfare. The third year we had 38 people. This year we've got 60 people going. Um, every of the 10 largest investment banks in the world, only one of them is not represented on uh, this trip. So I think um, that and uh, Robert told me, which I have a hard time believing, that over 50% of the volume of the uh, First North Exchange is Africa oil. So I think you're you're seeing a lot of interest uh, on all sides, not not uh, not only investment banks, but the, the big oil companies as well. Um, since we announced we have a, a a viable development candidate, and since uh, my interview in this Oslo press, which said we might be looking for a partner, uh, my phone's been ringing off the hook with the big boys, and uh, I keep telling the same thing: come come see me in about a year. But some of them aren't aren't willing to wait. I think we may be getting some offers to come in. Um, uh, in, the, in the short term. But anyway, this well was thud, and we'll, we'll actually within about two weeks start seeing the objectives in that. Uh, I'd expect to announce that one sometime late October, early November. Uh, I want to spend just a little bit of time talking about the development project because it is important for us. Uh, as much as I say we're an exploration company, uh, a lot of people are valuing us on development. In fact, I, I would make the argument that uh, most of our share price right now is on the value of our discoveries in the local car basin. I don't think we're getting a lot of upside on our share price for, for expiration upside. Um, partially due to the market. I think the market is very risk averse right now. They're not giving credits for expiration. Uh, part of it is some of our peer group have kind of blown up. If you look at companies like Chariot and uh, African Petroleum and uh, HRT and um, uh, OGX, I think we're, we're suffering a bit because some of our, our competitors haven't done very well. Uh, so I, I do think uh, as we keep moving this uh, development project forward, we're going to get more and more credits for that. So uh, certainly we won't ignore that. And this is really the hard value in the company, which is that the, uh, uh, the bigger investors are, are, are keen on. So um, the key, of course, is the pipeline. Uh, some of you may have seen in the last uh, uh, week that the Kenyan government has come out and announced that they are tendering um, this pipeline. It's going to be in three segments. It's going to be from our block to Lamu, it's going to be from Uganda to our block, and it's going to be from southern Sudan to uh, our block. So we're going to be the, the hub that's basically that collects all of the oil in East Africa, um, and we're going to be the first one in line. So the, 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 build, the building sequence is basically build this first and then add on Uganda, add on Sudan. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's still a lot to go on this. It's early days. Uh, frankly, we were a little surprised when the government went out. But, for, for pipeline tender, but we're actually uh, encouraged that the government is being very aggressive. And there are some people, I think, that are going to take that tender very seriously. I wouldn't be surprised to see some, some fairly competent uh, international contractors come in and, and bid on that pipeline. So um, happy to see anything that, that, that pushes this forward. Um, we are looking at possibly some startup production from here. The key to that is getting a road basically from Eldoret up to our block. Um, we need a better road to do trucking than what we've got, and if the government, perhaps co-investing with us, uh, will help us with that, you may see some startup production as, as early as 2016. Um, as far as when the, the big pipeline is going to be done and when it's going to be filled with oil, I think there's still a pretty big bar on that. I think uh, anywhere from 2017 to 2019 for first oil mile pipeline. Obviously, we want to do everything we can to, to speed that up. Um, but uh, we want to make sure we do it in an environmentally safe, socially acceptable, and technically competent uh, manner. And uh, if, if there is a pipeline contract awarded, certainly they will be uh, interfacing with us to make sure that it's, it's done in the proper way, uh, as we will be the primary customer. Um, we have learned a lot, a lot about this reservoir. Uh, we know we have good oil, but it's waxy. It has to be kept hot. We know we have, we have good reservoir. 23 to 29 percent porosity and 50 milliards. You've got the three nurseries of permeability. We know the lower reservoirs aren't as good, but in conjunction with the upper reservoirs, they still are a very viable development target. Uh, as a standalone, they'd be tougher, but completing that below where the uh, good reservoirs are um, will, will be uh, a big benefit for the uh, development. Um, again, the, the core data and the test data have given us a much better understanding of the reservoir 
we doubled our net pay at Yami, we doubled our net pay at Tiga, and we now have a recovery range up to 40% uh, in that uh, where we're staying. So that's a very good reservoir. It has a low gas content. We actually could use a bit of gas. We wouldn't mind finding some gas, not only for power generation for our project, but also to, to inject uh, to keep reservoir pressure up. Uh, we haven't seen any water yet uh, produced, which is good news. And we've seen no pressure decline or depletion in any of the tests, which also is good news because our reservoirs are widespread. We will need pumps. This is low pressure oil, and we will need to put pumps in, but that, that's not a significant issue. So we still have a bit of work to do. We need to know how far this pay goes. We need to know how connected this reservoir is. And we need to know what we need to do for water injection, gas injection, secondary recovery. So the thing we need to do for that is appraisal drilling and uh, hopefully an extended well test or an early production system will, will give us uh, most of that information. So again, the resources, we, we made a nice announcement. Uh, we went uh, from 28 million barrels up to 184 million barrels, a 550% increase in uh, our resources uh, uh, over a one year period, which I think is, is very good. Uh, and again, getting over basically threshold volumes for development. Our unrisk prospective resources, this is still, all of these numbers are net to us. So 10 billion barrels of, of expiration um, prospective still there. It went up a little bit, but not, not a huge amount. Um, but uh, uh, what did go up is the risk expiration. So last time we talked, uh, we had about a billion barrels on the risk side. Now we have about a billion and a half, so 50% increase in the risk number. So this is what our reserve auditor thinks of these barrels that we're going to be able to cover. And I think that's a, that's a, a number we would support. And in fact, I think it's a, probably a, a still on a bit on the low side. The other question is, is how much can we actually address? Okay, you got 10 billion barrels of resources. How much can you drill you know, with the money you've got, with the time you've got? Um, and the answer is variable, but in the low Kachar Basin, it's actually quite a, lot, quite a bit. So in the low Kachar Basin, which is our proven area, um, over the next 18 months, we will drill every one of these prospects, and we will appraise every one of these developments. So we've got 368 million barrels of QC resources now. On a risk basis, our reserve auditor thinks we're going to um, have four times that much uh, at the end of this drilling campaign, or about 1.5 billion barrels net to us. Oh, sorry, these, these are gross numbers. These are gross numbers. Uh, but more importantly, we've got 3.3 billion just in this basin alone. So right now we have 100% success rate. They're telling us we're only going to have a 32% success rate. I think we think this number is still conservative. So going back to what I said before, our, our baseline case is we think we have 2 billion barrels in this basin or a billion net to us. And I think people, people doing valuations of how much is our stock worth based on just this basin, everything else goes wrong. We don't find any new basins. We just have this one at 2 billion barrels, gross, 1 billion net. If you look at our analyst reports, they all say these barrels are worth somewhere between five and ten dollars a barrel in the ground. So, if we do get that billion barrels and we were able to prove that, that translates to a share price of twenty to forty dollars a share. So, as I said, this is, if nothing else happens, this is one of the best. Uh, uh, this is the best thing I'll probably ever do in my career. But um, we still believe that there's a significant number of uh, additional basins. So how are we going to pay for this? Uh, you know, it, it doesn't take a rocket science to know that we have a burn rate of about 60 million a quarter. We got 180 million dollars in the bank. So, you know, do, do the math. We're going to be out of money uh, sometime in the second quarter next year. So I think the market is very nervous about this. How we're going to fund this? I, I have to say I'm not. Um, I've never had more people call me up and offer me money in more different ways than, than I have right now. So I think uh, uh, some of the things we're pursuing, uh, one of my favorite ones is an industry deal. So all those big guys that want to come in early, I've given them a price that I think is so outrageous that none of them would, uh, would take it. And several of them are actually considering it and uh, um, I think we, we may have a chance. Um, what we're looking at selling is just 10% of 10 BD and 13 P. I will point out, for the record, Tullow is not in this process. Tullow has no interest in selling their, uh, their interest at this time. Um, but if I can get the, the numbers being bantied around, they're about $700 million for that 10%. Um, 
the way I get to that number is if you take our two billion market cap now, you assume that all of that is on the locust car basin, it means that 1% interest in the locust car basin is worth about $40 million. So I've told basically if they want 10%, they gotta pay 70 million up front for 700 million. Now, I thought they'd tell me that to, to, to get stuff, but they haven't. They, uh, uh, there are several of them that are still engaged. I, I think that does a couple things for us if, if we can do that deal. Um, I think it, it revalues our company. So that means if they're willing to pay 700 for 10%, our 40% remaining interest is worth $2.8 billion. Um, it also gives us all the money we need, not only in 2014, all the money we need in 2015, and we won't ever have to come back to the market again um, uh, until we basically go into a development plan. <laughs> the other thing we're looking at is sovereign wealth funds. So sovereign wealth funds are, um, are interested in putting money in um, in big chunks. And we'll, and we'll need, the goal of whatever we do financing next time is to make it the last financing we do before we basically do a bigger strategic alternative. So, so let me repeat that. If we get the money that we raise in whatever method that we do this time, be it a, a, an industry deal, a bond, or an equity deal of some type, the, the theory is to get us all the way to development decision. And then the next deal we do is going to be an industry deal. Whether we bring in a strategic partner to develop the company or we uh, go ahead and sell the whole company at that point, um, that is the plan to, to, to make that the last one. <coughs> Uh, strategic uh, 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 sovereign wealth funds are very keen to write bigger checks and we're looking at probably $300 million as the next raise to see us to that point. So those are the kind of checks that they like to, to write. I've told them that if they do it, they'd have to do it at a premium to market, 10, 10 to 15% premium to market. Uh, and I think they think that may not be such a bad idea because I think we are suffering from a financing overhang. You know, we, we, we announce results and we don't get the bang for our buck like we usually would because people are still trying to figure out where we're gonna get the money going forward. So I think that's one of our alternatives is go to one of these sovereign wealth funds. One person can write one check, fill out our funding needs. And the thing I like about that is they are long-term holders. These aren't guys that are gonna buy and sell stock. They're gonna hold stock um, till the end. Um, the other thing we're looking at is bonds. Uh, bonds are not normally a thing that exploration companies should be looking at. You know, it's essentially kicking the financing down the road. Um, if everything goes great, they're the least dilutive, they're, they're a perfect solution. But with no cash flow in the, in, the, in the foreseeable future, if things don't go great, you know, it's putting a, a bit of a landmine inside your, com your company. So we're working with some of the, the bond market is very strong right now, particularly in Scandinavia, and we're working with some of the bond traders to find a, a solution that, that kind of protects the downside for us. Um, uh, it's definitely the least dilutive of, of all those. And then the last one is, is kind of more of a traditional, uh, I would call it a, a pseudo rights offering, but uh, um, you know, we're looking at you know, some of our bigger shareholders, some of our long-term shareholders, who, again, they're contacting me, telling me they'd like to put more money in. Um, and I think uh, that is a viable alternative, but frankly, I'd like to exhaust some of the other alternatives first. I still think that industry deal, if we can put it together, is probably the best thing for the company. So I think the message here is we have a lot of different alternatives to finance. Uh, we are going to take one of them probably before the end of the year. And my goal is to just make it the least dilutive and best for the shareholder. And I think uh, you'll see a decision made on that uh, uh, before the end of the year. Uh, we do have a big budget this year, 209 million net to us, 567 million gross. That budget's probably going to go up a bit next year. I would expect it to be over 250 million net to us. So we, uh, we do have a, a big expenditure going. So we will need to, uh, to, to put more money in the coffers. But again, of all the list of things that I that keep me up at night, um, finding the money is not uh, one of them. Uh, we do have the luxury of being in the one being group, and if things don't go as well as we'd like, or there's there's uh, uh, issues, uh, uh, political issues, or whatever. Um, the London family will be standing behind us, which is maybe a reason I sleep a little better at night than I should. Again, you guys know the story, uh, to fulfill one of my favorite slides. Um, we've gone up seven times, eight times our value. Uh, the group just tells me if I, if I only do 10 times our value, I'll, I'll be the slacker in the group. You know, we've, we've averaged 32 times our money. And I, I honestly believe there is a lot of room left in this stock. 
And I've been involved in every one of these companies with the exception of Red Guy. And what we're being good at, I think, in Rondi Group is, is risk versus reward. And uh, of all the stocks in this group, I'd say Africa Oil is one I think has probably the, the best risk reward ratio uh, that I've seen in the group. So it's still early days. We still have a lot to do, but uh, um, uh, I think I see still a, a very bright future ahead. Uh, I do want to spend uh, some time talking about our CSR um, uh, program. Uh, many of you know I moved down to Nairobi about a year ago. About 80% of my time is spent on these issues. I think as technical risk goes down, I think political <coughs> risk goes up. So we're working with a new government who, up to now, has been very favorable to oil development. They're a very business friendly, a very uh, uh, organized government. And I think we've had, uh, they have a cabinet of people from the business sector, and uh, it, it's, it's really them asking us what do you need from us. Uh, we have seen no indication that they're going to try to take things away from us. Uh, in fact, contract stability is something that the, the World Bank and all of their advisors have been preaching to them, and they, they basically say that uh, that is sanctified. So I think what our real goal is now is trying to work with the, the federal government and the local government to try to make this a positive experience for as many Kenyans as possible. Uh, we spend a lot of time working with the local communities, trying to build capacity there, you know, my goal is to, you know, if this development's going to cost somewhere between four and seven billion dollars, my goal is to have as much of that money stay in the community as possible. So the local Turkana people, they see a great opportunity here, um, but there is a division between the local communities and the federal government. And I think uh, not only us, but the World uh, Bank, the uh, you Norwegian know, consultants, uh, all the interested parties, the NGOs, have to work to get that bridge. That, uh, the, that this money benefits the local citizens yeah. as much as it does uh, the, the federal government and the, um, um, and, and the, uh, the rest of the country. So they are working on a sharing formula. I think they're making good progress on it. Um, as I said, we're working with the local communities. One of the things we're working on very hard is transparency. You know, that's, uh, if you look at the countries where they call an oil curse, uh, the oil curse is generally predicated by corruption. That uh, the oil revenue doesn't go to the population in general; it goes to a few select political individuals. I don't think that can happen anymore. I mean, we have joined the EPICI. We report every penny we pay to the government. Um, the PSAs um, uh, should be public information there. The government has pledged that they're joining the EITI, which is the Extractive Industry Transparency Initiative. And I, I have to say, I'm very positive on on, on what they're doing so far. Um, building local capacity is a big thing for us. You know, the, the Turkana people have been marginalized for 50 years. Uh, there's not a lot of skill sets up there, so we're looking at setting up a technical training center up there. You know, it's not necessarily just to train geologists, geophysicists, petroleum engineers. It's to train welders, to train plumbers, to train pipe fitters, uh, to train skilled labor that can, can work in the oil field uh, development. So we are also doing uh, scholarships and, and looking at uh, building up capacity in the universities for the, for the upper skills level. Um, we have many stakeholders here. It's not just the local Turkana people. Uh, uh, this is the birthplace of civilization. This is where Lucy, where the Turkana boy was found. So this is where the oldest convoy uh, fossils in the world are. So we're actually working very closely with the Leakey group. I've uh, become pretty good friends with Richard Leakey and, the, and his family. And in fact, I just joined the the Kana Basin Institute board uh, about uh, 10 days ago, and we're uh, uh, working very closely with them. We have two archaeologists that walk every seismic line. We've actually found 58 new sites um, since we've been walking the seismic line. So when we see something that looks like it could be uh, of interest to the archaeologists, we just move our line over. I think uh, when Richard Leakey told me when he heard me, I was coming, they were very upset about the oil companies coming. Now that they've seen we've acted in a responsible manner and we're a positive contribution, they're actually very happy to have us, and, and, and we're working together with them on a number of initiatives up there. Um, water is a very big issue here. Some of you may have read that they just found two big water sources up in Turkana. Uh, but it, it is, wars are fought over water up here. So we have to be very careful about the water supply and the water we need and make sure that we're not depleting water for the, uh, the local people. So this is a constant ongoing thing. There is no beginning and end to this. This is a constant engagement. Uh, Alex Button, who's our, our VP of External Affairs, this is his full-time job. 
it's almost my full time job too, but um, I'm spending most of my time on this. And uh, so far, I'm quite encouraged uh, that things are, are going the right way here. But it's, uh, it's something we need to, to remain vigilant on. And I think it's our biggest risk. If we don't get a, a, a community relations and government relations right, if we don't have our social license <laughs> operated, we will fail here. It's, it's the cornerstone of our business, and we spend a lot of time and effort on it. So, to kind of sum up, uh, um, I think I'm going to change this statement. Uh, I don't think Africa oil has the best onshore acreage position in East Africa. I think we've got the best acreage position in the world. I don't think it's just East Africa, and I don't think it's just onshore. You know, people ask me, Show me something that compares to this, and I, I can't. I, I can't find a basin anywhere in the world with 100 unfilled prospects the size of the North Sea, good contract terms onshore and where we can explore. So I think this is this is as good as it gets, and we're in, in a very good location right now. Um, with the three discoveries we've made, we now have a development um, project, and we have a very um, significantly lower risk of exploration. Um, this has now come to fruition. We will have six rigs working for the foreseeable future. Um, three rigs, uh, two, two wells spud this week, one spud next week, two will spud in October, in, in addition to the rig we already have. So you're going to see a high impact well every month from now on. Every month there's going to be a result from now on. Uh, new exploration basins, keep a very close eye on this. For those of you that have followed the story and understand the story, this is the most significant thing you'll see. If you see us report a new discovery in the Kibahar Basin, in the Western Kama Basin, uh, in the in the, the Karia Basin, each one of those basins layer cakes on top of the Lokachar Basin. So the, the Lokachar Basin hopefully will just continue to ramp up in value. But the next step change, the one that's where you're going to see the stock go 50, 60, 70 percent, uh, if, if the market is savvy, is when we open up one of these new basins. Because it has the same type of billion to three billion barrel potential as the Lokachar Basin. So I think you know we're getting. Uh, this is the most analysts that have ever covered the London stock. We've got 24 analysts covering this. Um, they all have a very positive view. The average is about eleven dollars and forty six cents a share. They range up to sixteen dollars a share um, uh, one month target. So I think the analysts are, are very uh, keen on the story. I think uh, the. Uh, um, uh, the, the, the financing needs to be addressed. I think we'll get rid of the financing overhang before the end of the year, and then people can start fun, um, focusing on the fundamentals. So people have asked me what the, the largest risk in uh, Africa oil is for a shareholder, and I still say, as I always used to say, it's not owning the stock. <laughs> All right, thanks very much.